Hello, this is the instructor's lecture for high key, low key learning unit. So the concepts that I'm going to cover today in my lecture are high key, low key in photography, in camera metering modes, understanding your histograms, and a brief introduction to post production. So here we're looking at a photo by Candia Hoffer and it's a great example of high key photography. This is an image that she took. Um, I'm not sure how to pronounce the location. It's somewhere in Germany, um, but it's a, you know some sort of a architectural structure, a stairway going up. The way that she's exposed it, she's overexposed it, so there's just a little bit of detail in the whites, and she's getting this very graphic image. So I'm going to introduce you to a couple of artists this week. But just so you can look forward to learning more about them later, this is the work by Carrie Mae Weems. She's one of my favorite artists, video makers, photographers. Check out her work. This is um, Rinko, Rinko uh, Kawasuki. Sorry, I probably mispronounced that. She's a really fabulous photographer. Great example of high key. This is the work of Nan Golden, a really awesome example of low key. She does a lot of work around love and all sorts of interesting stuff. I'll leave it there. Another good example of low key photography by an artist that hopefully you'll look more at her work, Jessica Bachand. And so just as a little reminder, what we've been talking about are the different tools that you have for exposure measurement. And so we've talked about the shutter speed, controlling your f-stop, which also controls your depth of field, your ISO, paying more attention to your in-camera meter, so getting it to a normal exposure or a correct exposure, and then adding more light, so this is going to be plus one, plus two. Being a little bit aware of those concepts of full stops, like we talked about, so all of the things that you've been working with, you're going to want to apply to this week's learning information. So one of the things that I've just really, whoops, sorry, uh, briefly touched on is uh, exposure modes. And so I'm asking you guys to work in manual, but there are a bunch of other exposure modes in your camera. So just again, to quickly remind you, um, you can read more about them, program, aperture priority, shutter priority, what hopefully you're working in manual, different types of auto mode, and then there's also scene modes. And these are things that you just, you know, should be aware of. Um, some of you might prefer to work in these different modes, but I'm hoping that most of you are trying to work in your manual mode. So you have more control over your exposure outcome. And one of the things that you can control when you're working in manual mode is your in-camera metering modes. And these are also really important. And I'm just going to briefly introduce you to it. Um, so you're aware of it, but in your, most of your cameras, you have evaluative metering, which really collects like all the information from the exposure and then averages it out. You have center weighted and you have spot metering. Those are the three sort of major metering modes that are available in your camera. And you can find a tutorial to see if you want to change your metering mode to something more specific. Spot metering is going to be um, a metering mode where it pretty much like accumulates maybe about 5% of the frame. So wherever you have, usually it's in the center of your camera, you can move it around, but you do have to get pretty familiar with your menu. So if you're getting a very um, closed amount of information, your camera can give you more, potentially more accuracy for your exposure. So these are the different definitions that you might want to refer to for the weekly quiz. But um, like I said, I'm mostly going to encourage you to learn about the matrix or evaluative, which again, it depends upon your camera, center weighted and spot. Those to me are the three modes that I think for my shooting are very valuable. And here's kind of a visual example of that. So it's showing you where they pointed the spot meter, right? So they got the meter information in the shadows, right? There's this subject, little object, kind of right by a window, looking out a window, so it looks like it's an overcast day diffused light. 
and it's a much more open exposure. So it's accurate for exposing this little object. As you can see, matrix metering, which is the default for most of your cameras and probably your phones as well, um, evaluates the whole scene or evaluates the information predominantly from the middle of the camera, but still it's not giving you a very accurate exposure if you want detail in your subject. So I want you to be aware that your camera has these different types of metering modes and I'm going to encourage you to learn more about it on your own. Come visit me during my office hours, shoot me an email. There's some um, tutorials in the learning unit, but I think you should definitely know that your camera has different metering modes and how you might want to use them. Also, what we're going to be talking about is the histogram with this learning unit. And basically it's a graphical, it's just a kind of a funny word, a graphical representation or display of the tonal values in your image. And so um, your histogram is something you might have seen before. Oftentimes it comes up in your playback um, on the back of your camera. If you push a button that you're not aware of or not used to pushing, or maybe you're using histograms already, um, you would have seen something that looks like a black mountain like this or something with lines. And what it's telling you is it's evaluating the exposure. It's giving you all of this great information that indicates uh, what's happening in the highlights and the shadows for your image. And so it's telling you in this um, combination of a, of a display of this image called the histogram and then the actual him image. And so it's pointing to the, the value, right? Because the um, histogram goes from 0 to 255. And so 0 is going to be complete black, absolutely pure black. 255 is going to be pure white. So in between, you have all this range of tones, right? So it's kind of showing you um, where these different tones might land on your histogram, which is really you know, you learning how to read your histogram, which is an important skill. Um, more information about this exact, you know, the shadows always being to the left of the histogram, the midtones in the middle, and the highlights on the right side of the histogram. And here's a definition of the histogram. It's oftentimes on the back of your LCD screen. And just so you know, like, it's not 100% accurate. It's oftentimes looking at the JPEG version of your image. Even if you're shooting in a large JPEG or RAW file, it's still, um, it's helping you with your exposure, but it's, it might not be as accurate as what you'll see when you upload your images to a computer if you chose to do that. So, so basically there's a couple of different types of contrast and how you would read these histograms. And then we're also talking about concepts around high key and low key. So I think that the histogram informs you to be able to better adjust your image exposure to get the image results that you want. And this week we're working with high key and low key. So here's a low, low contrast image, some gray rocks, and this is the type of histogram you would see, which again is predominantly showing you tones in the middle range or the middle tones. Um, so you could define that as not many tones in the shadows or the highlights, mostly tones in the middle tones or gray areas. But we don't want to confuse low contrast with low key. And what the images that you're going to be making this week for your um, photographic homework assignment are low key and high key images. And so low key images, if you were looking at the histogram, you're going to see predominantly no tones in the highlights, mostly in the shadows. And oftentimes low key images have dark objects in them and, a, and or a dark background. So these little areas are probably what you see in the reflection of the glasses. To get an exposure like this that's a low key, you oftentimes get a normal exposure and then you have to underexpose your image. So again, this is all about controlling the final outcome. Your camera reads everything at 18% gray. Obviously, these glasses in this background are very dark. So to get them the quality that you probably would want, 
you need to underexpose, and in this case, by two stops, and they're underexposing using their shutter speed. So let's keep going with this and paying attention to both the terminology, high contrast, and the histogram. So we've moved from low key and low contrast to high contrast. So a high contrast image is going to be an image, if you look at your histogram, not many tones in the middle tones or the gray areas, mostly tones in the shadows or the highlights. So you can kind of see where the, the tones predominantly lie. And when you look at the image, you can also see that there's highlights and then it's a silhouette photograph. So it's exposed for the highlights where the shadows turn into um, complete darkness, right? We don't want to confuse high contrast with high key, which is obviously a very different type of histogram and a very different type of image. But it's easy that these words could be um, misunderstood. So let's make sure that we pay attention to the vocabulary and the terms for this week. A high key image is basically going to have really no tones in the shadows and mostly highlights. And oftentimes to get a high key image, you have to do something which is called bracketing to one side. So we talked about bracketing and bracketing was usually you would uh, get a normal exposure and then you would underexpose and overexpose, which we did a few weeks ago. Bracketing to one side is something that you would want to do for high key or low key photography. And in this case, you would get your normal exposure, but you would that normal exposure wouldn't give you this bright white with detail. You would need to um, overexpose by two stops from the normal exposure to get this really high key quality image. Let's keep talking about it. So here's even a better example. Well, maybe the image isn't as great, but it shows you this idea of bracketing to one side. So if I just take an in-camera meter reading, it might give me something for this image at f8 at 1 25th of a second. And it's a decent exposure, but I want this to be a high key photograph. And I want my subject who is being illuminated mostly in the shade. Um, I want to open up that exposure. And so here, once I've opened it up two stops, now I still, the, the, the overall exposure for the subject that I'm interested in and the way that I want to communicate being on this boat in this high key image quality type way, I need to overexpose by two stops. So these are some of the concepts that we're going to be navigating in this learning unit. So now I'm going to go over some examples um, of low key photographs and what the histogram might look like because we're mostly focusing on high key and low key and the terminology and what your histogram would look like. So here's some examples. Again, that definition of low key is most of the tones are gonna be in the shadows. And so these are great photographs where there's not a lot of highlights due to either the time of the day or the way the subject matter is being controlled by having a completely black background. And you know, you can carry around with you something that's black if you're gonna photograph flowers and have someone hold it or try to figure out a way to place a big piece of black fabric um, behind whatever your subject is. Here's some artists who, it's a lot of artists that work specifically, and there was even in the learning unit, some of my photographs that are very much motivated by these concepts of low key and high key. So here's a quote, the artist creates the material that we look back upon as part of history. So Roy de Carva, a wonderful photographer to check out, and a lot of his work is inspired by the concept of shooting low key style photographs. Edward Burktansky, another example of low key because of the subject matter. Todd Hito is another Bay Area photographer who uses a lot of who uses the concept of low-key photography in his night landscapes. And then some examples of high-key photography and what the histogram would look like. Again, now most of the tonal information is going to be on the right side of the histogram, as you can see in these two images.
and some examples by artists that you might want to look up. Um, Joyce Tennyson, someone we've already talked about, who does a lot of high key type imagery. She puts flour, uh, like baking flour, on her subject's skin to have it even be toned more down so it doesn't get shiny and overexposed. Olivia Parker is another photographer I encourage you to look at. And a lot of her work goes in between the idea of high key photography and then low key photography. And here's some student examples of what you hopefully to get inspired of how you might want to make photographs exploring high key exposure and composition and low key exposure and composition. So this idea of bracketing to, bracketing to one side is going to be really important. Your camera, like I was saying before, predominantly wants to make everything 18% gray. So to get this white mouse uh, and on top of a white book, on top of a white piece of paper, um, and framed in such a way with just really simple window light, you have to overexpose it by two stops and you're still going to get a lot of detail in the highlights. And of course, if you had the histogram, it would be predominantly to the right side of the histogram. Another example of students work, working with this idea of needing to bracket to one side. So this would be the normal exposure from the camera, but it makes everything kind of gray and muddy. So by overexposing, and in this case, um, opening up the f-stop, which you can also see because the bottles in the background are a little bit less in focus. Just more examples of simple setups um, to explore this idea of high key. And then some examples of low key. So just again, camera on a, a black background with um, just a single lamp on the left side and some sort of a fill card. You can buy something or you can just use a piece of cardboard with white paper stapled to it. Be, DYI is super fun with photography. But again, by underexposing it to get the low key, so minus two stops, you have a much better exposure of this camera. And just more examples of how low key you're basically underexposing to get a true black since your camera normally exposes everything at 18% gray. And that you need to underexpose, it could be a stop, it could be a stop in two thirds, it could be two stops to get those blacks to be rich with just a little bit of detail. And so just really quickly, I'm just gonna introduce post-production. Um, it's something that I encourage you guys to do. There's a bunch of links in the canvas shell. But basically, after you've taken your image, a lot of photographers do some sort of post-production. Here's an example of a photograph by Annie Lieberwitz where the post-production is taken into kind of a surrealist direction. So her post-production is part of her art and her creative process. You can do really simple corrections and modifications, which is pretty much how I use Lightroom, which is the post-production program that I prefer. There's lots of programs out there. There's lots of tutorials out here, out there. Um, it's just a matter of how you want to relate to your photography and then kind of like painting with light in the computer applications that you use. So I hope you enjoyed this lecture where we reviewed high key, low key photography. We reviewed your in-camera metering modes and your in-camera metering system, a little bit around histograms, and just a brief introduction to post-production. Another funny image by Annie Leberwitz. Here she is on location. That's her taking the pictures. And then once it's been massively post-produced post and you know looks completely different. Um, so everybody's going to do it different. I do want you to be aware that these are great tools and that hopefully this technique of high-key, low-key photography will be something that's of interest to you. Thank you for listening.